Good morning. Welcome to Grace United Methodist Church. We come here to praise the Lord and to just open our hearts to the Holy Spirit and allow him to have his way with us. We forget about what may have happened last week and what may be coming up this week and focus on our creator, God Almighty. Prepare your hearts for worship this morning as Ginny plays our prelude. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you for meeting us here in this place this morning. What a joy it is to be in your presence, to be in your house. And Father, we pray that as we sing and lift our voices to you, that it brings you great joy, that you understand through our praising you how much we love you, how much we um, just want to be in your presence, in the presence of such a mighty God who loves us, who cares for us, and who knows us personally. Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit open, opens our hearts and minds to all we want, all you want us to receive this morning. Amen. It's been a crazy week. As Ginny plays, as we're going to sing this in just a little bit, let's just stop and close our eyes. Take a deep breath. Let's invite the Holy Spirit into our into this place this morning. We ask that He gives us peace and He gives us comfort in this crazy, crazy environment that we call life right now with the COVID situation. Not knowing what's going to happen next week with the schools or with businesses or, or our economy or, or our government, we don't know. But the one thing we do know is that we have a God that cares. We have a God that loves each and every one of us. And he said in his word that he would never leave us nor forsake us. And if we can't take God at his word, then Jesus died in vain. I believe God's word. I believe what he says in his holy book. His promises are yes and amen. So let's stand and let's sing.
Huh. So what's coming up this week? Thanksgiving. So what do we do on Thanksgiving? <laughs> Give thanks. That's right. What else do we do? Eat food. Yeah. And give thanks. There's a lot of families who um, have a, a, like a tradition where they go around the table and say what they're thankful for. If you don't have that tradition, maybe you could start that. Each one of you would say, you know, I'm thankful for. Normally, um, it's, I'm very thankful that I have my family together, but that's not happening this Thanksgiving. So um, I have to be thankful that I know my family is well and happy and alive, even though I won't get to see them. 
So that's happening with COVID. Everybody's dealing with it just a little bit differently. So um, what we're studying um, right now, what the sermon will be about later when you guys are having fun in Sunday school is Matthew 25. Has ever, anyone ever heard Matthew 25, the scripture? Have you ever heard a reference to that before? Okay. Um, Matthew 25, there's some, there's, there are ministries that are sometimes named after that. Matthew 25 ministry. Um, we have an uh, account at The Rock. We have money in this account called Matthew 25, and we help people with it. It is money that's donated, and then people who can't pay bills, can't um, get the medicine they need. Is that hard to imagine that there's people out there that have those kind of problems sometimes? Because, you know, we're pretty, we're, we've been all been very blessed. And so there are times when people need help. And so we're available. And we call it the Matthew 25 Fund because Matthew 25 is all about, the end of Matthew 25 is all about helping others. So maybe when I read this story, you'll, you'll kind of remember that you've heard it before. What book, or where is Matthew in the Bible? Old, New? Yeah. New. Is it the first, last, in between book of the Bible? Yeah. Or New Testament? Yeah. First, first. Matthew, and then what comes up next? Mark. Then, yeah. then. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You did good. Very good. Okay, so this is Matthew 25, 46. This is the very last sentence in Matthew 25. It says, if someone does what the Lord wants, he will be with God in heaven forever. One day, the Lord will decide who goes to heaven and who doesn't. We call this the final judgment. Jesus will divide all the people into two groups. He will say to one group, God wants you to be in heaven with him. Do you know why? The Lord gives this answer. I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink of water. I was sick, and you gave me medicine. When, when they ask, oh, when they ask, sorry, when they ask, Lord, when did we do this for you? So the people were um, asking why some would go <clears throat> to heaven and some don't. And he said, because I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty. You gave me a drink of water. And they said, Lord, when did we see you and do this for you? And Jesus will answer, when you help anyone that is my child, you also help me. If you give someone who isn't important a glass of water, it's like giving it to me. It's like giving it to Jesus. To the other group, he will say, go away from me. You are the devil's children. I was thirsty, and you wouldn't give me anything to drink. I was hungry, and you didn't even give me a bite to eat. They will be surprised and ask, when did we see you and not help you? And Jesus will then say, you weren't willing to help the most unimportant of my children, so you don't want to help me either. So what we need to remember is that we should always help others. And it doesn't matter if it's someone we, we are friends with or not friends with. It doesn't matter if it's somebody um, we know or don't know. It doesn't matter if it's somebody who's been mean to us. As God's children, as somebody who says Jesus um, is who I, who I love, we do the right thing. We always reach out to others. And so I think it's important to remember that there are lots of people who are not as fortunate as we are. Some of those are right in our midst in our schools. Some of them are um, maybe farther away. And we know in big cities, there's a population that um, just don't have the funds and the means of doing things that we do. And then across the world, across the um, globe, there are people who just don't have much. When I, I went to Guatemala years, um, I don't know, 12 years ago, I think it was, 11, 12 years ago, and there were people who did not have water, well, all the people I met did not have running water in their house. There was no water in their house unless they went somewhere and got it and brought it back. They had to travel. They had to walk miles to get water and bring it back. I didn't get a shower for five days. 
it was the worst five days of my life. Well, the last four, the first one was fine. But it's, it, it wasn't. It was a wonderful experience because you know what? Even though they didn't have all those things, they still found a way to be joyful because they believed in God. So even when they don't have everything that we have, they can be filled with joy because they're children of God. So anyway, so what we need to remember, Matthew 25, you'll probably hear that um, as you grow in Christ, as you learn more and more. Matthew 25 is a very important chapter in the Bible. And it's all about why we are here, why, why God loves us. And it's, we are filled with love, so we can't help but give that out to others. Do you ever feel so full of love you just want to do something nice for somebody? Good. <laughs> Next time, go ahead and do something for anyone. It doesn't matter. Just do something nice for someone else. All right, let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving us. Help us to always help others, even when we don't want to, even when we're tired, even when we just don't feel like it. Help us to do it anyways, because you love us. Amen. It is time that we um, go to the Lord in prayer. We've had many prayer requests. Each week when I send out that text, it seems to be more and more. And we all know there's a lot of hurting people in the world, uh, you know, in our midst, in our midst. Um, I think we would be um, blind to not see that COVID has taken its toll on us as a community. And um, it, it divides us, but it also just wears us out. Um, so we need to work even harder not to allow that, allow that to happen. We need to pray for each other, and we need to uplift each other and find a way to meet together in some form, whether it's face-to-face -face or phone or whatever it may be. Um, here are the prayer requests that I have, and again, I tell you that they are, on, there's a piece of paper like this on the back in front of the um, hand sanitizer, and you can pick one up. Carol, D, Carol had heart uh, tests last Thursday, and she's having some additional tests later on. Bev uh, was in the hospital, and now she's transferred to skilled nursing at Otterbein. Bobby, Donna's nephew, may have to postpone surgery. Um, it's not, um, not good. Um, pray for the hospital staff. They've been very busy, more COVID patients every day. Uh, Nancy, our volunteer at the, um, at the Rock and goes to Walnut Grove, is on the men from COVID. She is, um, her quarantine time is almost over. We have prayers for all affected by COVID, those who have it, their families, those who have lost loved ones to it, those who are isolated, the loss of income that may come about, those who are choosing to cancel family gatherings, and those who are choosing to gather. All of us who are trying so hard to adjust to this new way of life. Scott's grandparents, I've been giving you updates the last, I think this is the third week, and um, unfortunately, and with much sadness, I tell you that Grandpa Deringer uh, passed away yesterday morning it, from COVID. He had been in the nursing home and um, recuperating from a surgery and was doing well and about to leave, and they tested him and he had COVID, stayed, and, and it ended his life. 
Grandma Keller is getting stronger and is at home. Grandpa Combs is in Wapak Nursing Facility getting stronger each day. His Grandma, Grandma Combs is in St. Rita's getting stronger. Prayers for Jeff, Tracy, Lexi, Peg, and all who are dealing with cancer. It's a praise Bill Russell came home. A praise for the beautiful children in our churches and for the teachers who teach them. We are blessed. Jack, Wynette's brother-in-law, has breathing issues. Nanette, Wynette's sister, had an infection. Prayers for Jason Ballinger on his road to recovery from surgery. It will be a long recovery. There's a praise that Joey, the premature baby we've been praying for, is healthy and home with his family. Praise be to God. Pray for those with disabilities to find acceptance and employment and a purpose. Sharon, uh, Sharon's son Joe, keep praying. He is doing better. Thank you for your prayers. Bob, Andrew's uncle, has been sick with lung issues. Reggie, Andrew's neighbor, is in the hospital with COVID. We need to pray for those who are angry and bitter um, in this world. Uh, Lynn is doing better. She has no pain, but she is just um, just trying to get by knowing that she can do so little each day because of the fatigue that comes from the surgery that she had and for the just recuperating. And um, some days she's more patient than others. But we're not going to pray for her to have patience because then we know that just brings on more reasons to have patience. So, but we're going to pray that um, she finds peace in each day, just knowing that um, God will use her and is using her, as always. She said it's very hard to be on that side of the prayer column, <laughs> needing the prayer instead of being the prayer. So um, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Oh God, thank you for this. Thank you for the solid foundation we have in you. Thank you that you have given us a house built on rock, that it is solid, and that when all of these storms come our way and toss us to and fro, that we can stand firm as your children. Firm in the hope that you give us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. No one is exempt from what's going on in, in the world right now. No one is exempt from getting COVID or dealing with the harsh sickness of it or dealing with somebody who has it and seeing them fade. It's... it's, it's because we profess you as our savior, it doesn't mean that we won't face trials and tribulations and doesn't mean even, Father, that we will succumb to those at times. What it means is that we always have you with us. What it means is we don't live for this world, but we live for the world you are preparing for us. This is not our final home. This is the home where we prepare to meet you one day. And God, we thank you for your grace and mercy that keeps us going every day, that love that just empowers us and moves us. We thank you for being a God that is personal to us, for being our way maker, miracle worker, and the lover of our souls. Father, you heard the list of our prayers this morning. You know those who are hurting. You know those who are dealing with life's most difficult situations. And you are in each of those moments, each of those situations. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you that not one person on this list has to go through what they're going through on their own. We pray that we as a church and all the church as a whole can reach out and, and help somebody and be available to someone who needs us so desperately. 
We pray that we find innovative ways to be your hands and feet when we can't be somewhere in person. We know that this time is ending, Lord, and we know that there will be a time that we can, but in this moment, hear our prayers. Heal your people. Father, we repent of the times when we are not who you've called us to be, when we have thought of only ourselves and not of others, when we haven't even kept you in the forefront of our minds, let alone the least of these. Forgive us when we have been the least of these and have not reached out so that someone can be blessed by helping us. Because, Lord, when we reach out to someone else, we are reaching out to you. And that can only draw us closer and closer to you every single time we do that. Father, help us to fall in love with you all over again. Like that very first day when we realized how much you loved us, may we just bask in that moment. May every day just be a reunion of that time, a remembrance of that time when you were the most important thing in our, in our lives. And may we never lose sight of that. May we never reach out for so many other things that we forget that you are our, our life. You are the reason we live. In the midst of all the bad news that we deal with, may we remember the good news of Jesus Christ. May we remember we are your children. And may we remember there are people who have not heard of you. There are people who do not understand you. There are people who don't know you. And we are here to open their eyes, their ears, to, to tell them about you, to plant a seed that we may never see grow, but somebody else will along the way as they water it and fertilize it. Or help us to be those who water and fertilize. Whatever our, whatever our job is on that path, for somebody else to know you, Lord, open our eyes and give us the courage to do it. We pray for all those who make decisions on the behalf of others, those who have been put in positions to make important decisions for the lives of others. Father, we pray that they, they are empowered by you. We pray that their motive is you and love and all that you stand for. We pray, Father, for when the ridicule comes for them, when they, people don't like what they do and they're so, they just spew it out, the ugliness that comes out. May they know that that is not who they are. They are your child and they are loved. We pray for our law enforcement. We pray for the nurses, the doctors, all the healthcare professionals, everyone who takes care of us, Lord, the firefighters. There are so many people who are just always available, and we don't even know it until we need them, and they're there. Bless them and keep them safe. We pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus, our Savior. James Version, the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 25, verse 31 to verse 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, 
Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in? Or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, Inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you um, for the truth, and Father, sometimes the truth hurts. <laughs> you have our attention. May the Holy Spirit give us wisdom as we hear your message this morning. Amen. We are not only at the end of Matthew chapter 25, we are also at the end of Jesus' life at the end of Matthew 25. Jesus is using this time to teach his disciples extremely important lessons. He is adamant about their being prepared for the second coming, his second coming. He's saying to them, I will come again, and you need to be prepared. It's a desperation for his disciples. We talked about the beginning of the chapter, the ten virgins, five who were prepared and five who were not. Five were not ready for the bridegroom's return. They were not prepared for the long wait. They had not brought enough, enough oil or additional oil for their lamps. Their lights had fizzled out. In the second parable, the third servant was not productive as he waited for the return of the master. He handed back his talent to the master. No more, no less. Made excuses why he didn't do anything with it. I buried it forgot about it, did nothing with it. Here, you can have it back. His life did not honor the master in any way. Just had a picture of standing before Jesus. Yeah. I know you gave that to me. Here it is, you can have it back. What'd you do with it? Oh, I didn't do anything with it. I'm going to back to you. As we get into this well-known parable that we're getting into of the sheep's sheep and the goats, I first want to point out that this is not a list of things to do, a list that can be checked off. And the reason I'm pointing that out to you is because I actually did that myself as I read it. This is not a list of things that we do. It's not tasks to be completed. Have I given food to the hungry? Check. Have I given, some, given something to drink to someone who has something to drink to someone who is thirsty? Mm -hmm. I've done that. Check. Did I ever take in a stranger? Well, does it have to be overnight or just like into my house for a moment? I remember that one person came to the door and it was really cold out and they were selling something. I let them come in. So, yeah, I've done that check. Clothe the naked. Oh, I give clothes out all the time. 
and I know I visited the sick, visited somebody in prison. Hmm. Well, maybe I haven't done that yet, but I will, and then I'll be able to check that off. That's not what this passage is all about. We can never check off enough things to be finished serving. This parable represents a way of living. Am I living this way? Am I feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, clothing the naked, visiting the sick, reaching out to someone in prison? It's not, have I accomplished those things? It is, am I living that way, the way that God wants me to live? What is surprising in this parable of the sheep and goats is that um, there's no mention of the criteria criteria. There's no mention of the criteria for entering God's kingdom to be um, confession of the faith in Christ. Let me reword that. What is surprising in this parable of the sheep and goats is that the criteria for entering God's kingdom in this parable of the sheep and goats, in the criteria for entering God's kingdom is not confession of faith in Christ. Hang with me. There's no talk of justification or the forgiveness of sins. What counts here is whether one acted out their faith. Do we lovingly care for others? This parable reminds us that what we do for the least of these are not things that we do for extra credit. It's the way of living that we have to adopt. How we live is the deciding criteria of judgment. And somebody's, the hair on the back of their neck just stood up. How can that be, Pastor? You tell us all the times it's easy as ABC. Admit I'm a sinner, believe Jesus is to be my Savior, commit my life to God. Now you're telling me it's, that's not the way to eternal life with God? Which is it, easy or difficult? Do I say the words or do I do the words? I'm telling you that Jesus is telling us salvation is way more and even far different from being moved emotionally and responding emotionally, perhaps like at a revival. The, move, the music moved me that night, and I ran to the front, and I said, I want what you're offering. Or saying yes at confirmation, because that's what we're told to say as we stand before our parents and grandparents. It's more than declaring, I was born again on January 1st, whatever date you were born again. So what about if I say it this way? Our good deeds are not the root of our salvation. They are the fruit of our salvation. The root, the the origin and source of our salvation doesn't begin with the good deeds. Salvation comes from our commitment to God, confirming Jesus to be our Lord and Savior. That is the root of our salvation. That's the beginning. That's the source of our salvation. And from that salvation, from that declaration of commitment, we display fruit. We show our commitment through our deeds. James 2, 14 through 24, and it's long, so, so stay with me. It's, it's good. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe there is one God, you do well. 
Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then that man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Verbal faith, faith that consists only of words without actions is insufficient. A faith that does not demonstrate itself in works is not genuine. Works do not earn salvation. Works alone do not earn salvation. They are proof of salvation. They are the proof of a genuine conversion. Charles Spurgeon said, The child of God works not for life, but from life. He does not work to be saved. He works because he is saved. I think we need to remember... This, we need to remember that we have, when we have committed, you know, sometimes we do the A and the B. We forget the C. We admit we're sinners. We believe Jesus. We want Jesus as our Savior. We forget about the commitment. And that's what Jesus is saying. When we truly turn our life over to him, when we let him change us, and convert us when we repent and do what he calls and, and, and we truly want to live a life like Jesus the fruit will come forth I think it's interesting to note that the sheep the righteous in this parable don't recall performing the services listed when did we see you hungry and feed you when did we see you thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? They were not doing these things to gain access to heaven. They did them as evidence of their true faith. They weren't trying to impress God or marking him down on their list so they could present them to him someday. They were doing it because this is their life that they were living. They were like, wow, I don't recall any particular instances of doing those things for you, Lord. It's because it was their way of life. It was the way they lived. You know, if we give food to one person one time, we'll probably remember that. If we are constantly giving food to others, it's just what we do. If we give our time one day to one person, we'll remember that. But if over and over again we are available to people in need, it's a way of life. And I'll be honest with you, if I may, for a moment. Some days serving others is easy. It's even fun. And it's extremely fulfilling. And then other days, not so much. But Lord, I'm tired. But Lord, and whatever follows after that. In those not-so-much days, when our weakened flesh takes over, 
we can find encouragement through scripture and also from this poem, Mother Teresa's poem, Do It Anyway. I don't have it all here for you, but if you don't know what that is, look it up. Mother Teresa, Do It Anyway. She lived her life that way. But one part of it says, the good you do today will often be forgotten. Do good anyway. Hebrews 6.10 says it like this. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it will all come out in the final roundup. You know what I think is cool, though? The sheep don't have to remember everything they've done to help God's people. They don't need to have a list with check marks. They don't need to write it all down. Nor will the goats have to remember what they didn't do. <laughs> He'll know. He'll remember. So that's what we focus on. Not earning that salvation to get through the final roundup, we focus on this loving God we have, a loving God who cares for us, a loving God who wants his children to take care of each other, a loving God who has given each one of us gifts and talents that enable us to reach out to someone else and be a need that's unfulfilled in their lives. But I do things for people all the time and no one does anything for me. Do it anyway. But I feel like I'm the only one doing it. I'm the only one doing my part. Do it anyway. But I'm so busy. Quit being busy. And do it anyway. Because I'm telling you, <laughs> Jesus tells us nothing sounds better on this earth than to hear in that life, the next life, well done, good and faithful servant. Gordon Weekly, once a prominent Baptist pastor in Charlotte who succumbed to prescription medication abuse, then amphetamines, wound up on the streets, but then was miraculously cured and engaged in stunningly transformative ministry to the addicted and homeless. He was known to hand out this anonymous piece, and you may have heard it before. I was hungry, and he formed a humanities group to discuss my hunger. I was imprisoned, and you crept off quietly to your chapel and prayed for release, for my release. I was naked, and in your mind you debated the morality of my appearance. I was sick, and you knelt and thanked God for your health. I was homeless, and you preached to me of spiritual shelter and the love of God. I was lonely, and you left me alone to pray for me. You seemed so holy, so close to God. But I am still hungry and lonely and cold. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Amen. Amen. It's home, doesn't it? You're never finished. You're never finished doing God's work. Never. Not until your very last breath. The call to do good things for others. As we enter into this season of Thanksgiving, as Bev shared with the children, it is time to be reflective on things that we are blessed with and have been blessed with. 
So as we gather around our tables, or maybe not, this Thanksgiving season, one thing we can give thanks for is give thanks to the Son, Jesus Christ, for what he's done, for the price that he's paid on the cross. You know, as Bev was sharing some of her of our stories, you know, we don't have enough time. I don't want to do that. It often comes to me, what if Jesus said as he went to the cross, I don't have time, I don't want to do that. You know what he did? He did it anyway. And he did it for us. So let's stand. And let's sing, give thanks. Remember, for our Advent Bible study, we will be studying on our own at home. Grab a, a sheet to help guide you, and um, we'll come back next Sunday and, and be talking about that very scripture and, and what we have discovered. Um, for those online and not able to be out and about and come into church, we totally understand. And we, I want you to know that I have posted that on the Facebook pages for Grace United Methodist Church, Walnut Grove United Methodist Church. Um, this Bible study is listed there for you to join in with us. So now as we go, um, for those at home and for those here, receive this blessing. During this Thanksgiving season, may you truly understand what we have to be thankful for. May you grasp, grasp the reality of Jesus Christ, who he is and how much he loves you. Go in peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.